Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 22nd annual Charles L. Elenfeld Lecture. It is truly amazing as the dean of this College of Law to think that we have had the privilege of having the Elenfeld Endowed Lecture for 22 years. It is such an incredibly enriching endowed lecture, um, and today will prove to be one of our highlights. The Elenfeld Lecture was endowed by the Elenfelds, um, who uh, are a very important family, not only in Wheeling, but in West Virginia. And their importance really stems from their generations of commitment to public service. And hence, we call this the Elenfeld Public Policy Service and Ethics Lecture. Today's lecture is going to be delivered by the Honorable James G. Carr, Senior Judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Ohio, and he will be introduced by Professor Valina Beatty. So good afternoon again. It is wonderful to have you here for the annual Charles L. Elenfeld Lecture. This, has, this lecture has been made possible through a generous bequest in Mr. Elenfeld's will to establish this enduring lecture. It exemplifies his dedication to public service and to ethical public service, something that he was deeply, deeply concerned about and embodied in his own life. He, the founder of the series, was a prominent West Virginian who practiced law for more than 56 years and devoted himself to ethics and public service, contributing to his community, Wheeling, West Virginia, in many ways, always with the utmost passion and integrity. His service included state, local, and federal positions, exemplified by his service on Wheeling City Council as prosecuting attorney for Ohio County and United States Magistrate for the Northern District of West Virginia. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us several distinguished guests, um, which includes two generations of the Elenfeld family. With us today are Mrs. Elenfeld, the wife of Charles Elenfeld's son, William, or Bill J. Elenfeld, Sr., who's a 1965 graduate of the College of Law and a person who carries the torch for public service and, and ethics and exemplifies his father's legacy. In addition, we have his grandson, Mr. Bill Elenfeld, the, 1990, the second, a 1997 graduate of the College of Law, who continues his grandfather's legacy and his father's legacy, becoming the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia in 2010. His public service is exemplary. He has already established a reputation after only four years as a strong, committed, and ethical U.S. attorney, particularly in some very important environmental hazard cases. Will the Illenfelds please stand so that we may recognize you and your family's generosity? <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to recognize Professor Valina Beatty, who is uh, one of our clinicians at the, at, the universe, at the law school and who is the director of our Innocence Project. She comes to us from the University of Mississippi. We were delighted to be able to steal her away. Um, she's making a huge difference in West Virginia herself along with her students, and I invite her to the podium to introduce the Honorable James G. Carr. Hello, uh, welcome everyone, and I'm delighted, I really am delighted to be able to introduce uh, Judge James E. Carr of the Northern District of Ohio uh, as our Illenfeld lecturer today. Uh, I had the true gift of clerking for Judge Carr right out of law school, and uh, I actually, his talk is on the FISA court today. And I uh, was able to clerk for him while he was serving on the FISA court and he was making long drives back and forth between Toledo and D.C. to, to serve that. Uh, and I, I really want to convey that Judge Carr has impacted so many people's lives. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't even realize how many people he has touched uh, as a law professor, as a judge, 
and as a role model. Uh, he's well known in national security circles for um, presiding over terrorism cases and also for his kind hearts decision. Uh, he's known in my world of innocence work for uh, one of the first opinions dealing with DNA evidence nationally. Uh, and uh, he's also written the original treatise on the law of electronic surveillance. Despite all of this work, Judge Carr has always been a very busy man, but he always took time for his clerks and to get to know his clerks. Uh, he also always encouraged us to seek out work that was rewarding and meaningful and of service. Uh, among his clerks, we've gone into academia, we've gone into government work, uh, we've gone into nonprofits, but always with that commitment to making our profession better and understanding how we as lawyers can serve our communities. I also want to say not only has Judge Carr been a role model in terms of work and service, but also he always valued his family. If you ever meet anyone, who knows Judge Carr, uh, they know about his family. And they know how much he loves his amazing wife, Eileen, uh, and his four daughters. One small example is that in his office, he has a wall, and it's rotating photos. And when I was clerking, it was rotating photos of his four daughters. I went back a few years ago, and it's now rotating photos of his granddaughters <laughs> and his grandsons. So he still makes time for his family. And I really aspire to be like him in that way as well. Um, I want to share particularly with the students here how Judge Carr has been a true mentor to me. Um, he's been kind and generous and supportive. Uh, and I've turned to him more than once when I reached a fork in the road uh, professionally. So I encourage all of you really to think about it and to look to the people who inspire you and to seek out mentors. I mean, this man has given me amazing professional advice, and there are other people at this law school in our communities in West Virginia who can also be mentors to you and who want to be mentors to you. So I encourage you to really seek them out. Judge Carr has really fostered in me my own sense of public service. And to that end, uh, it was no surprise to me when uh, his New York Times op-ed was published last summer about the FISA court and uh, when he testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee last summer as well about the FISA court. Um, he really has committed himself to talking about the FISA court and about our civil liberties and speaking from the unique advantage of actually serving on that court. He has made the decision to show us a little bit about that court and to open up that discussion, especially in the wake of um, the Snowden NSA revelations last summer. So to that end, I truly am honored that we at WVU can host Judge Carr and that he is able to be our Illenfeld lecturer due to this generous endowment uh, as he continues his public service and speaks with us today. Before I'll begin, you now understand why I say this is the most favorite Valina in my entire life. Uh, she's the only Valina in my entire life, but nonetheless she is. Thank you very much for those remarks. And it's a pleasure to be here, particularly in the company of the um, daughter-in-law and grandson of the outstanding lawyer and public servant who endowed these lectures. And it's a pleasure, Mr. and Mrs. Ewanfeld, to be in your company and to have you here. Uh, my lecture, my talk really, it's not less a lecture than a talk, I hope, uh, will be structured. First, I want to talk just a tad, remind you all about the Fourth Amendment, and, and it's, a, it's a bedrock of our, our liberties and our ability to be free from government intrusion. Talk a tad about the law enforcement use of electronic surveillance devices uh, to overhear telephone conversations oral or spoken conversations and electronic communications. To set somewhat of a frame to, and then I'll turn to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and uh, to set a frame so I think you can get some better understanding of 
the significance of that statute, how it differs, some of the problems that it raises, and how the court functions. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. So the right of the people to be secure in their houses, papers, persons, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or thing to be seized. Written, obviously, in the late 18th century, where things like cell phones and telephones and uh, computers were unimaginable. But nonetheless, the, law that, the laws that enable government, whether in the interest of law enforcement or in the interest of protecting our country from foreign dangers, ultimately must conform or be held to conform to the Fourth Amendment. And that's not particularly easy. The Fourth Amendment really has at its, at its core a couple of policies. The first is it was written in direct response to the general warrants that the Crown officers had received, particularly customs officers, uh, without judicial oversight, uh, based upon an official's directive to go out and search a warehouse or whatever. Totally unlimited. The customs officers would go wherever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to, stay as long as they wanted to, and look for and take whatever they wanted to if it appeared to have been smuggled or otherwise unlawful. And so the amendment prohibits that kind of general search conducted solely at the discretion of the police officer. And it does so by the warrant requirement. And that, that puts a judge between the police officer and the citizen and the citizen's privacy. And the warrant also says that the judge cannot issue a warrant unless it particularly describes the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Now, if you think about that, in a conventional search, that can be drugs, guns, contraband, books and records, whatever. Uh, physical, tangible items, they exist. As long as they show probable cause, it's some connection with a crime, and they are to be found where the uh, officer indicates, the judge issues a warrant, the officers go out, they knock or kick in the door, the person's there, even if the person's not there, the person finds out almost immediately upon coming back, will find that items have been taken, the warrant is left, that's the commission of the law enforcement officer to break into or go into over the objection of the homeowner, it's judicial authority, probable cause, and they also get an inventory, they're told what is taken. They can react immediately uh, by either calling Mr. Elenfeld in the U.S. Attorney's Office and saying, what can I do to help, I'm in trouble, uh, or calling a lawyer or whatever. And if you think about it, fitting uh, electronic surveillance into that kind of model is very difficult, at least conceptually. Uh, an electronic search has a lot of characteristics that are very different from a conventional search. Um, first of all, you don't know what it is you're going to intercept, whether it's by listening uh, or recording or downloading, if it's an electronic communication, email or whatever, because that's not yet in existence, unlike the tangible object. An elect, uh, with a conventional search warrant, physical search warrant, you get, you're unnoticed immediately or almost immediately, and you know it's been taken. With an electronic search, obviously you can't be told in advance, because if you were told the DEA or FBI or state police are going to be listening to your phone or reading your email for the next 30 days, it would be useless. So there's no prior notice. Um, electronic surveillance lasts a lot longer. Conventional searches and I think Mr. Elon will probably anywhere from a couple hours to half day or day maybe. I mean, that's relatively short, even when they are extensive, pretty much in and out. That's not true with an electronic search of whatever kind. Again, telephone, spoken communications, or electronic communications. All three are covered by the federal law enforcement statute, which I will touch upon in a moment. And then all those are also covered as our physical searches and surveillances uh, by the FISA statute. Electronic uh, surveillance affects far more than just the target. Most of us probably have been picked up uh, in, 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 uh, even on the FISA warrant. I'll explain that to you in a moment, believe it or not. I don't no reason to get upset or frightened. Um, no, seriously, uh, and perhaps even otherwise. Uh, but in any event, 
So it's not just the target in his or her premises of a, as in a conventional search, because everybody that the, with whom the target communicates that is within either earshot or vision of the electronic surveillance, the, the officers executing electronic surveillance order, will have his or her communications privacy affected to some greater or lesser extent. Now, when they execute a surveillance order, they, they have to do what's called minimizing. I'm talking about law enforcement, where they show that there's a probable cause of a crime. They come to an ordinary Article III judge like myself in the federal system or state judge here in West Virginia, and they have to show probable cause to believe that uh, so the, the target whose phone is going to be communications are going to be listened to or whose car or home or office they want to put in a bug or whose electronic communications they want to intercept. For law enforcement purposes, take a drug case, for example. They show probable cause that the person is involved in drugs. They show probable cause to believe that the person will be using this computer, talking in this automobile, using this cell phone number. And they also have to show, because there's no prior notice, that it's necessary that other means, conventional means of investigation, law enforcement means, have either been exhausted, would not be successful, or be too dangerous. And it's a crucial aspect of the, the, the law enforcement surveillance application process, what we call Title III. Mr. Elenfeld can tell you about some of those in detail, but in any event, very pretty, relatively pretty routine. There's probably two to 3,000 of those issued by federal judges throughout the country in a given year. They run for 30 days. It can be renewed. An important aspect of judicial oversight, which is another problem with an electronic surveillance, is that the order in the federal court requires the agents and prosecutor to meet with me periodically. I meet once every Monday. I meet with them. How are you doing? What are you getting? Are you complying with the minimization requirement? So, and I find continuing probable cause. So there's, at least there's some aspect of judicial control in the ordinary law enforcement wiretap sense. And in executing it, and this is very important because this is how the law enforcement surveillance complies with the Fourth Amendment's restriction or prohibition of a general search. And that is, in the order under the statute, they have to minimize the interception of non-pertinent conversations. And how they do that is they can listen at the outset to everybody to whom the target speaks and everything they say, but for a brief period. They have to develop patterns of calls and callers. And once they do that, when they find out that Valene is the target and she's, you know, uh, I'm the target, let's say, and Valene is my spouse, but it turns out she doesn't know anything about it. It's quite clear. But then she, they can no longer simply listen to everything we say when I call home and get told to pick up a bottle of milk or whatever. Um, now, on the other hand, if Mr. Elenfeld and I, heaven forbid for either of us, are suspected of being engaged in, in drug dealing, then everything he and I talk about. We can even be sitting watching Game 6 of the World Series at the Super Bowl and talking to each other. But because we, there's probable cause to believe that we are in this together, they can listen to everything. But as to everybody else, they have to first develop patterns of calls and callers, and then they can go up and down. They can listen for a little bit to make sure it's still Valina and I, that I haven't, I haven't gotten a you know, call forward and come in that I switch over to him. But they have to minimize. That's how the general search prohibition is met. All the courts have considered this have agreed that Title III is constitutional, law enforcement surveillance, despite these various difficulties of fitting an electronic search, its long duration, the lack of prior notice, the numbers of people affected, the inability to define with real specificity what it is you're going to be acquiring electronically. The courts have all agreed that does fit. That, that uh, square peg does fit within the round hole of the Constitution. It's not general searches. Because of minimization, there is judicial oversight that's ongoing. The judge controls, to some extent, what the officers do, how much they listen to, what they acquire, the extent of the invasion and intrusion into the communications privacy of everybody who's talking to me if I'm the target. They try to minimize it. And that's Title III. At the end of it, up to within 90 days, 
the government has to give you notice. If you get a notice probably from the attorney's office saying, you know, dear Mr. Carr, you should understand that this is hereby to notify you that from uh, September 13th to January 25th, uh, an order issued by Judge Walensky of the Northern District of Ohio, your telephone number, whatever and whatever, was subject of a surveillance order. That's all the notice you get. Only if you get indicted are you likely to get the actual application and find out what the basis was for that order that was so intrusive. And only if you get indicted are you also likely to find out what they actually overheard. So the notice issue is much different than it is with a conventional search. You know right away. With a wiretap, how many of you, if, if you were given that kind of notice, September 19th to January 20th, how many of you had any idea what you might have said at various times to various people? You might have a list of your, you know, the numbers you called, but that would be about it. So the notice, but all of that's been held to be constitutional. Now, finally, I'll talk about, talk about what you came to hear, I gather, to hear me talk about. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. In 1940, President Roosevelt authorized the FBI to engage in warrantless, you know, no judicial review, solely at the directive of the President and the Justice Department, uh, warrantless wiretapping uh, in the interest of national security. That's why, before Pearl Harbor, uh, our agents were listening to the Japanese embassy in, in Washington, D.C. And that was the beginning of the federal government's involvement in foreign intelligence surveillance. It was using technology to learn what other people, foreign-based people, are up to, what they're thinking about, what they're doing, what they might be plotting and planning. During the 1960s, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's came out in 1974. Uh, basically, they had, took the, they had taken the authority that had been expanded through the, through the Justice Department and the executive, and as you're all well aware, among other things, uh, conducted electronic surveillance, telephone tapping in that instance, and bugs in Dr. King's hotel rooms and so forth. And those were the techniques that were in use there, microphone surveillance and literal wire tapping. Uh, I asked the students in Molina's class, maybe, what, 60 people? How many of them had a landline phone? And one poor student kind of timidly raised her hand in the back. But we still call it wiretapping, even, even though it's, you know, it's these devices that we use to communicate by telephone. But in any event, this all came out in the mid-'70s. Senator Frank Church of Idaho conducted a series of hearings. The Supreme Court had held in U.S. versus U.S. District Court in 1971, the unanimous decision, that the Justice Department, which had uh, engaged in wiretapping and, I believe, bugging of a group in Detroit called the White Panthers. It was an anti-war civil rights protest group. They were suspected of having been involved in a bombing of a CIA agent, CIA office, recruiting office in Ann Arbor. And John Mitchell said, well, I have the authority. I don't have to go to a judge. I can simply authorize the FBI because in the interest of domestic security, as opposed to foreign-related. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. It did not say what you could or couldn't do. They said, this is for Congress. We, we, we are not discussing, we're not determining what the president can or cannot do with or without a warrant in the interest of foreign security, where the target is a foreign government or has some foreign-based connection of danger to this country. So it was a signal from the court to Congress saying, you take care of it, or at least give it a try. And um, that plus the 1974 church hearings led to the enactment of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978. At that time, the act both created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, of which I served as a member from 2002 to 2008, meets in Washington. We meet solo. The court now has en banc authority recently acquired, and I don't know whether it has met en banc. I wouldn't be surprised that it has. But that uh, postdated my time on the court. And the court, so the court establishes, the, the statute establishes a court, its first seven members, now after the Patriot Act of 2001, 11 members, appointed by the Supreme, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, there's no congressional uh, review or confirmation, as there is, with an, again, with an Article III judge. Uh, it's all at the discretion of the Chief Justice. 
By statute, the judges have to be geographically diverse. You cannot be reappointed for a successive term. Three judges must live within 20 miles of the Capitol, for obvious reasons. And um, the statute is, of course, what gave the court its jurisdiction and its authority. And there, I think you'll understand why I spent so much time on the Fourth Amendment and on Title III when I now talk about the statute. First of all, the probable cause standard is not as it is with an ordinary warrant or a Title III order, the law enforcement, the, the drug uh, you know, target, the conspiracy order. There they have to show, the government has to show probable cause of criminal activity. For a FISA warrant, all they have to show is either a, 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 you're affiliated with, you are a representative of, or working on behalf of a foreign government. That's one set of um, orders. And the other, of course, which has become much more significant post 9-11, is that you are affiliated, a member of, affiliated with, or working on behalf of a foreign-based uh, terrorist, terrorist organization. Uh, it, in both instances, they have to show the foreign connection. For the one, the, how I describe that is, let's assume that the mythical kingdom of Xanadu has a consulate in Toledo, Ohio. And it's well known, everybody, listen, we know, they know, that their third commercial attache in Toledo, Ohio, is really the spy. That's the person who goes down and hangs around the Lima tank plant where all the tanks are built and tries to find out what he or she can. They rotate them. It's called slot succession. We know when that person, one person leaves and another one comes, that's their spy. Just like in Shangri-La, they know that our second commercial or agricultural attache is our spy. They're listening to us. We're listening to them. And that's why... If you called the kingdom of Xanadu to get a visa because you wanted to see fabled Shangri-La, you probably would have been picked up on a FISA warrant because you would have called, and there may well have been an ongoing uh, surveillance. It's commonplace. It's, I'm not giving away any classified secrets. I don't want to get – I don't ever want to see Mr. Elon felt in a professional capacity, especially on the other side of the bench. Uh, standing at one table instead of sitting before him. But in any event, so that, and, and that was pretty much what uh, the FISA was used for pre the first World Trade Center bombing and certainly pre-9-11. Pre and those orders run for, for a year and, quite, and, and are routinely reviewed. But that's all they have to show. And once they do, they don't have to show, as they do in a Title III, that it's necessary, that other techniques would, haven't worked, wouldn't work, would be too dangerous. So that requirement is not part of FISA. With a counterterrorism warrant, the probable cause standard is exactly the same. All they show is that the person is a member of a designated terrorist organization. And at my last count, I think there were 150 that our government's designated as uh, DTO, designated terrorist organization, that number may have gone up or down. I don't know. Uh, that was from the case, the Kindhearts case that Valina mentioned, a totally different subject. Um, but in any event, either a member of, affiliated with, or working on behalf of. And uh, once they show that, once again, they don't have to show that this is necessary, that, that, they've, that they've even tried other conventional methods or they wouldn't work. There was a different and a lower standard of probable cause. And, and basically, I, with the Title III, at least, I get they have to tell me why it's necessary. Um, they always do. And in fact, there are fewer turndowns by federal judges, ordinary federal judges like myself, of Title III applications than there are of FISA applications by the FISA court, of which there are almost have been very, very few. And the reason for that is the government meets those standards. Those applications tend to be, law enforcement applications tend to be 40, 50, 60, or more pages long, right, Mr. Unifel? The FISA applications can be even longer. And so they, it's a low standard of probable cause, and they meet that standard. And in almost the vast majority of the instances, 
Well, some, and those orders run for 90 days and are renewable. And uh, there's no intervening periodic oversight by the judge who issued the order as there is, remember I said I, we, I meet weekly with the Title III law enforcement on the record. How are you doing with minimization? Is there still a probable cause? Are you getting in? There's nothing of that sort. So there's no intervening judicial oversight the way there is in, in the interest of the Fourth Amendment and judicial control of what the agents are doing and, and how they're doing it and so forth. There's none of that with the FISA. And with the FISA, Everything is recorded. It is a general search. It is then reviewed promptly thereafter because the information that they're trying to get has a very short shelf life. It's not like the business that he is in and other prosecutors and investigators are in trying to build a case, collect evidence of crime to prosecute somebody. This is intelligence gathering. And on the whole, uh, the information that they gain I don't really know for sure, but I'm told in general terms, very often and not is of immediate use and value, maybe longer term, finding out, particularly in the counterterrorism world, who's talking, who's working with whom, who's doing what, who's communicating with whom, where are they, where are they going, whom are they seeing, and so forth. But nonetheless, it, it's, you're, you're learning information. That's why they call it intelligence gathering. You're not trying to develop evidence of a crime. Rather, you're trying to find out what people who have been shown to be a danger to this country, potentially or actually, are up to and whom they're doing, doing with whom they're dealing and what is it that they may be having in mind. And obviously, I would hope you would all agree with me that that's a crucial kind of activity for any country to do in its own self-interest. None of us wants to live through another September 11th to have that kind of attack, much less some kind of you know, foreign-based a governmental danger that affects our national security and, and well-being in this country. And one final thing that differentiates the FISA kind of uh, warrant uh, and, and order from the law enforcement. I mentioned with a search warrant, you find out about it right away, or you come home and things are gone, and there's the warrant and the inventory. With a Title III, within 90 days, you learn a little bit, not a whole lot. It's called an inventory. It really isn't, but the courts have said that's fine. With a FISA, you will never get noticed that you overheard, whether you were a target, much less whether you happen to be a casual, somebody casually speaking with, with someone who happened to be the, target, the subject of a FISA order. The only way you will ever find out is if you become indicted. If, if in fact, during the course of the investigation, let's say it's counterespionage, and you find out that the commercial attache has crossed the line and now is engaged in you know, clearly in clear violations of American law. Well, usually that's handled diplomatically rather than in court, but potentially the FISA take could be used for that. FISA take can also be used if it develops evidence of a crime. It then can be turned over from the intelligence side to the uh, and the FBI now actually is, they work together, which they didn't used to do until about 10 years ago for various reasons. But that evidence then in turn can be taken to a prosecutor. It creates problems once the prosecution is brought. And Melina mentioned a couple of cases in charging, uh, conspiring to provide material support to overseas terrorism. And in both of those cases, the defense attorneys asked me to disclose, to find out and disclose whether any of the evidence that the government, either any of the information that it got, was there a FISA? And if so, was any of the information that it got used to provide to, to, as leads to evidence or going to be used as evidence? I do not have the authority to order that sort of simply so ordered on the bottom of the order. Instead, the government has the opportunity to come in in an ex parte session, just the government, and myself, even the court reporter's security cleared and has a special machine, and whether there's FISA to take or not. And the government says, yes, judge, there was, and but judge, this is under the Classified Information Procedures Act, none of it 
either developed evidence is going to be used as evidence. And if it persuades me of that, if that's the circumstance, then and it very commonly is the circumstance, and I'm not going to indicate in either of those cases whether that was that, because, again, the mere existence of a FISA warrant technically is, would be a violation of uh, 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 be a disclosure of classified information. But in any event, the judge persuades, a, if, if the government persuades a judge that even though there was FISA, it has nothing to do with the prosecution, then the defendant and his lawyer never learn about it. So the instances in which a, even a defendant learns about the fact that he or she was either a target or otherwise heard over a FISA uh, is quite infrequent and quite rare, leaving, of course, defense attorneys, and there may be some of you in this audience who may even experience this, with a very high degree of frustration. The judge has been in there with lawyers from the government learning things that you don't have access to. But that, quite simply, is a way that, that Congress has required us. Because I have no authority. If I were to order, or if I were to call, if I had classified information, I were to disclose it on my own to a defense attorney in the crime, I would be guilty of a federal felony. I don't have any authority as a judge to declassify documents. That's in the hands of the government. So we meet by ourselves, the court, and I'll try to wrap up in about five minutes just to tell you how the court operates. First of all, and I, I have no doubt Mr. Elenfeld can, can confirm this fact, because it is a fact, that getting one of these things, getting a FISA, is not an easy exercise. Some random uh, FBI agent from Charleston or Cleveland or whatever cannot simply go to the FISA court and say, give me a FISA, war give me a FISA warrant the way a police officer can in many jurisdictions to get an ordinary search warrant. In many jurisdictions, no prosecutors are ever involved. They go to a municipal court judge, police officer gives them the warrant, and off they go. Uh, instead, the, it, it begins within the agency. It gets, I believe, vetted by the U.S. Attorney's Office, approved, forwarded to Washington, to the agency itself. And once again, I can simply ask you to trust me, but the relationships between the Justice Department, because it goes then, once the agency has developed the information, they go to the Justice Department and have the Justice Department prepare the application. And I have no idea how frequently, but I know that the Justice Department does not accept every request from the FBI, the Defense Department, NSA, or the CIA, or whomever, for a FISA application. Once it gets into the Justice Department, once it agrees, and I do know for a fact, was a witness to this, that the relationships between the Department of Justice and those agencies and bureaus is not always the most cordial. Because the Justice Department can be and is insistent that it will only go forward uh, with those applications to the FISA court that it, it thinks merit the investment of the resources and are well, well grounded and founded. One week, by, by FISA court rules, one week before the judge to whom it's going to be presented, in other words, before I show up, not later than one week before I show up and it's going to be presented to me, they have to submit it to the FISA court. When I began, we had a staff that included one legal advisor. When I left, there were five. I have no, no idea how many there are now. The legal advisors, they're not magistrate judges. They're not law clerks, but they, they are very well versed and experienced in this whole area. They know more individually than any of us does on the court simply because that's their job. And, and they, in turn, review and vet the application. They raise questions. And they'll either give, give us a note saying, you know, one year renewal, Kingdom of Xanadu, third commercial attache, or they may give us a somewhat longer memo saying, you know, no problems, counterterrorism, so forth. But I would show up on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, and I would be told on a regular basis, Judge, you, you, you've got 43 cases on your docket this week that are going to be presented to you, but this one, that one, and the other one. I don't know how many number. I'm not trying to be precise. But with some routine regularity, I'd be told a case is not being presented. That means some of those will never be presented because of the work that our legal advisors has done. A suggestion that, that I have made is that the court 
uh, register, keep a record of those instances where applications are submitted to the court but not presented to a judge because I think that would indicate that the court, through our legal advisors, is doing the kind of job that I think the public wants it to be doing, which is to carefully reviewing and vetting these applications, which we in turn do. I mean, from time to time, I would say to a legal advisor, uh, I want to meet with the agent and the government lawyer because I have some questions and problems about it. And again, I can't say whether or when I may have turned one down, it is very infrequent because the government puts the case together. Low standard of probable cause, keep that in mind. Um, and then we issue the order, and that's basically it. I mean, we, we sit, there are 11 judges, they sit on a rotating but somewhat scrambled basis. The government does not know what judge is coming next week when it submits the order. And in the rules themselves, uh, there's that, that's a requirement. There's also another very important requirement because that also codified the government practice. And that is when there's something new or novel, a new technique, a new device, a new method of acquiring this kind of information electronically or otherwise, the government has always been in the practice of saying to the legal advisors and to us, look carefully at paragraph 64 to 82. This is something new. Uh, you've not seen this before. Another judge may have, in which case I'd be told about what that judge did with that, but I'm totally independent. I could say, oh, no, I'm not going to do what that judge did. I'm going to issue the order. I'm going to deny the order. But the most important thing is that practice was codified in rules, which I actually wrote the first iteration back in 2007 or 8. It, it, the government is required to do that. And you can say, well, just because you say it has to do it, what guarantee do you have that it does? And let me give the law students in the audience a bit of advice and try to explain why I can trust the government uh, when it doesn't tell me something is in it and why I trust it when it does. And that is quite simply, that court, just like every other court in the country, depends upon candor and forthrightness from the lawyers who, and people who appear in front of it. And it is not a career-enhancing move for me to feel fool me once, because you're never going to fool me twice. And if it came out that the government, before the rules were there, didn't follow that practice, that attorney and that agency and those agents would have a very serious time problem the next time they came before the court, because word would get out. And it's that kind of working relationship, not, to, not a capital R relationship, the kind of way things work, because the government understands that you know, quite candidly, we get a lot of those, and most are very, very routine. Uh, some very rarely read like a Tom Clancy novel, but much more rarely it's like search warrants and Title III's. The government has the evidence and information. And uh, once it's been presented to a FISA judge and not been granted, if they want to present that application again, they have to go back to that judge. And that's the way that the statute seeks to avoid judge shopping. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions. I will say that uh, in my view and experience I had, and part of the reason I'm here and glad to be here is to try to, you know, to some extent give you all a bit of a peek behind the curtain of what goes on in a court that now has come very much into public attention. Uh, keep in mind when you, I mean, it is a general search. That's what the Fourth Amendment prohibits. There's no real judicial oversight as it's being executed, either for the year or the 90 days with counterterrorism. You say, well, how in the world can that fit within the Fourth Amendment? Because the courts that have considered it, the Supreme Court has yet to do so, have all held, and these are cases where FISA take has wound up coming into court, so the process has been challenged. A fairly infrequent number of cases, a couple dozen, I think, maybe a few more than that. I haven't, I am the author of a treatise. I haven't done anything with that chapter in my book since going on the court for reasons I hope that are obvious. Uh, I have a co-author from Notre Dame who does that. But um, because, and please think about this and keep it in mind when you're sort of thinking about this whole, what you're reading in the papers. 
The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and court are a tripartite compromise between the three branches of government. You read the Article II, which gives the President the duty to protect us against foreign-based dangers, and you don't see the word judge in there anywhere. It was, the framers of the Constitution didn't say at all that before you do something that you believe is in our national interest, you've got to go check in with a judge. The checking in that is done is relatively modest, but nobody knows how far the Fourth Amendment can curb the President's power, and nobody knows how far the President can ignore the Fourth Amendment. And the people whom the statute is intended to protect are just U.S. persons, that's U.S. citizens or lawful resident aliens. And if they're, if they're a target of these activities, an order has to be done. But even when there's an order against one of them, part of what underlies FISA is the fact that that individual is going to be talking maybe to some of us. And the court is there in a modest extent, in a fairly minimalist way, to protect the Privacy, the con communications privacy of those of us who might be communicating with a target. Protects both the target who's a U.S. citizen or, or lawful resident alien. You know, the concern with the, the commercial attache, attache from Xanadu, he's not within that category. They're not concerned about you know, his privacy interests because he didn't have any, uh, particularly as a representative of a foreign government. However, it's to protect those of us who will be talking to him. And so the FISA and the FISC lie within a constitutional shadow land. And, and candidly, I, I'm not – I hope it stays there. I'm not real eager to have any Supreme Court, whether it's the Warren Court, the Brennan Court, the Rehnquist Court, or the Roberts Court, draw those lines. Congress did something unusual. It said to Article III judges, you will – review this kind of application and grant it only when the government makes this cause. And the government, in turn, first of all, the judiciary has accepted that responsibility, but the government has as well, the executive. And it'll be very, there are a number of proposals being floated. I've made one that, and I, th I hope that this comes to pass, that the, give the judges of the court, or actually direct them, when the government comes in with the newer novel heads up, let there be a list of pre-cleared attorneys familiar, and a lot of them in Washington, familiar with the statute and the court and so forth and so on. Don't have a separate office. You don't need it to vet every one of these applications because it's there. It would be a huge waste of money and potentially of time, just as it would be with a routine search warrant or Title III. But there's that small category of cases where there's something new or novel like the metadata collection program, the PRISM program, which I see from the Times on Monday is going to be curtailed. But nonetheless, in that kind of situation, have the judges bring in an outside attorney. The other thing I think that should occur, and Senator Blumenthal and others are suggesting an entire separate office, but that would be very duplicative of the work that already occurs within the agency, within the Justice Department, within our legal advisors, and by us as judges. Candidly, folks, it would serve no useful purpose. Give the court the chance when it does have something new, and we do deal with that. We're on our own. There's not precedent in a lot of these, a lot of these things when something like that. The other thing I think that would be useful would be to give the authority the ability. And we write very few opinions, very few opinions. I mean, I, I wrote a handful in my eight, because you don't. You don't write them with a search warrant. You don't write them with Title III until there's a motion to suppress. But when you issue it, ordinary judges don't write opinions. We rarely did, but when there was something new or novel, we would, both to explain why we'd reached the result we did and also to be available to others on the court. And um, people have called for, and I actually think it's probably a good idea, that the court declassify its opinions to the extent possible. And I think the mechanism by which that could occur would be to give me, the judge, require me, when I write an opinion, because it's a, a Rule 11 issue, that along with that is an order to show cause to the government why this opinion should not be declassified in whole or part. And when the government comes in, then also have the outside lawyer come in, so that you have the adversary system. 
And I think it's important to introduce the adversary system at this level, even though to, again, to a prosecutor like Mr. Ehrenfeld and others, judge, you don't do that with search warrants. You don't do that with Title III's. But the difference with those two is they usually result in an indictment or a motion to return property with an ordinary search warrant. So the defendant knows and has the opportunity to respond. And at that point, post hoc, issues of legality can be raised. Uh, in the FISA situation, that opportunity doesn't exist. And the final thing I think an approach like that would do, first of all, if more opinions were properly declassified, unlike, unlike what Mr. Snowden has done, uh, then the, I think the community at large, all of you, would have the opportunity to become better informed about the court and what it does. But also, if there were a lawyer in there, and if I granted the order, I mean, when, I, when the court grants an order, the government is going to appeal because it won. But if I granted an order, if there were a lawyer there in that limited circumstance and situation, that lawyer could appeal to the Foreign Intelligence Court of Review, which is three appellate judges, appointed just as we are, but just three of them, has met a half dozen times under various circumstances, because providers have objected, or once the government appealed, maybe twice, and that also would provide the opportunity to get issues to the Supreme Court, and none of that exists today. And I am glad to stay for as long as people would like for questions. I hope you've been able to follow me, because I know I've covered a lot of territory in a limited amount of time. But most importantly, uh, I, I hope you have some assurance that the court works as a way it was intended to work for Congress. I can only say, speaking for myself, I knew that what I was dealing with potentially, in some instances, was very important. I did not want to be a judge who let a building go down because I turned down an application. I didn't want to be a judge who further shredded an already tattered Fourth Amendment. And I think at some point, I would hope that the community at large comes to understand that when a federal judge takes not only the oath of our office as an Article III judge, but the oath that I took as a FISA court judge, it's meaningful to us. It's not a rubber stamp. Uh, we don't rubber stamp search warrants, Title III's, or anything else that we do. And um, I'm more than welcome for any kinds of questions at all. And I realize I'm supposed to shut up right now, but I'm more than welcome to stay. and. and Thank you for your attention, and I, I will, whatever questions you would like to ask, please feel free to ask. Anybody? Anybody at all on anything? Yes, sir. Is there a hand up? Yeah, yes, sir. I've got some vision issues, yeah. Okay. And uh, let me ask you, you say when they come in, they make an application, uh, you give them a, um, an okay for a general mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if I can interrupt your, hit the pause button. What happens then, they have to, quote, minimize but they, they listen to the recording shortly afterwards. And what they do is they note the minimization is a little upside down. They note the pertinent conversations and where they are on the – I don't know what the – it used to be tape, and then it was, you know, computerized, and it was optical scan. This, I don't know what the technology is that the recording occurs in law enforcement or otherwise. But everything else, they have no record of. And, and the, the disks, when they were disks, actually are kept physically. I had a question about that once, and I went to New York. And this may sound funny, but it's true. And, and I said, I want to see, I want to make sure that agents can't just wander in and sign out, or AUSAs. And I, I, without saying any more than that, I would say that was the issue. Well, after meeting with people and being told of the, the policies, I went down and met the woman who there then was in charge of the security of those uh, recordings. I have never met anybody who reminds me quite so much in appearance, demeanor, and attitude of my late mother-in-law than that woman. It's true. Nobody was going to get through her. I mean, 
Sure, someday there are people involved, but go ahead. But that's, that's minimization. They can go back to the disk and look at that part. But I would have a problem if the government would then look elsewhere on that disk. And, and I've actually made that clear in a couple of circumstances outside of the FISA situation. That would be, in my view, a re-hyphen search. For that, then they would have to get an ordinary conventional criminal. And I don't know if I anticipated, answered, or deviated from your question. Yes and no. Okay. Um, what, what I was uh, going to say was, uh, let's just say I'm the target. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I make phone calls to mm -hmm. sell. search of any kind affects a broader scope of the individual, which is one of the reasons that the statute, as modest as its probable cause is, as often as the orders are granted, nonetheless, in part, is there to protect the people you're talking to. Thank you. And you can say, Judge, it doesn't work, but that's the way it does, okay? Whether it works or not, you can make your own judgment. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. First of all, Judge Carr, thank you so much for being here. I had the privilege of sitting in on our crim pro, sitting on and listening to you this morning. Um, I'm interested in international criminal law, and I guess okay. my question is kind of focused on that. I know generally in the United States we have this presumption against extraterritoriality. Mm -hmm. um, what, have there been any instances of FISA applicability outside of the United States? Um, and if not, uh, how does the court kind of deal with this globalization of communication? Um. Well, the second part, if I knew, I couldn't say, okay? The first part, <laughs> uh, I'll, seriously, I, you know, if he weren't here, maybe I'd go. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first part is the FISA stays within our boundary, mm -hmm. okay? It, it, it's operable here. If, if, for example, I am a, even an American citizen, uh, well, actually, if I'm an American citizen, and it's an American conducted operation overseas against me. I carry the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not in that category, and there's a FISA up on me here, you know, the fact that I go back to you know, South Yemen or the tribal areas of Pakistan or whatever, I, I don't know, but I can only, I really truly don't know. Uh, but I assume that the, the collections are continuing. Okay. But, but again, I'm not an American citizen, I'm a resident, you know, uh, and we can also talk to our, you know, our intelligence people can talk to theirs, and there's a whole issue about at one point do we kind of take control, mm -hmm. that's another whole issue generally. Okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. I could see why you're such a valuable mentor to the well, Lena. Um, I know Edward Snowden is kind of the elephant in the room, so I, I want to ask a, a, a question. Um, you know, I know the sentiments about him have ranged from whether he was a patriot engaged in an act of civil disobedience or a traitor engaged in a criminal act. And I gather from your comments that you feel the system now works pretty well within it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've felt that all along. Okay. Okay. Right. So just to, just to finish my question, not to preempt your answer. No, go ahead. You know, with the Actually, tension. Actually, you anticipate a question there, but go ahead. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll dance. <laughs> no, go ahead. That's right. um, 
So in this tension between national security and the Fourth Amendment, which, you know, increasingly public opinion sides with, understandably enough, sides with national security, what room is there? Um, you know, I, I noticed President, ex-President Carter had a book out this week in which he spoke sort of essentially positively of Snowden's act. So what room is there in the legal system for those without the traditional standing, mm -hmm. like Snowden, uh, to challenge uh, those orders? Well, so far not, except one district court has held a, I forget the name of it, I think it's Judge Leon, I think in the District of Columbia, has allowed a case challenging the prison program. That's the metadata collection. And another judge has held no, and so at some time that issue may even wind up in the Supreme Court. But that's one reason that I think it would be important on rare occasion to have another lawyer in there representing really not just the interests of the target, but of the Constitution of people. I mean, ultimately, and, and to give me a better sense of information, I just don't need it in 90 plus, but once in a while I do. And it's my view. I've actually heard the President endorse it, and it's the only thing that Mr. Snowden and I would agree on, because in his talk a week or 10 days ago, he did mention that the FISA court ought to have a lawyer in there representing us. You anticipate, how many of you think that what Mr. Snowden did was worthwhile. How many of you think it is laudable? How many of you think it is neither? Okay. Let me, this is my personal view. It's probably the single most catastrophic security breach in our country's history. The consequences of which are utterly unpredictable and unknowable until they occur. Edward Snowden is no Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg, and I remember reading top of the New York Times that Sunday morning in 1969 or whatever, 71, seeing the Pentagon Papers article in the Times. But Daniel Ellsberg stuck around, and I believe he got himself indicted. And I would agree that Daniel Ellsberg did a public service. I could at least say arguably a Snowden sort might have done something worthwhile, except for the fact he went to China and Russia. I was actually in a debate with one of his attorneys and three other people, four, four, four other people, and I was the only one taking this position uh, out of UCLA uh, a week ago today, I guess, or two weeks ago. Um, in any event, uh, his lawyer said, well, he didn't take anything with him. You know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you believe that? Now, here's a man, he may not have taken an oath. I can only assume that at the very least he signed confidentiality acknowledgments. I hope that Booz Allen did at least that much to protect us. And those of you who are lawyers think about this. You've got a partner. And you, you have one main client. And that client is in litigation. And it's your job, and it's bet the company litigation. It's your job to win and to keep that client going and keep the well-being of your office going. You try the case, you lose the case. And there's something about it that you just couldn't get your hands on. Somehow, everything you were going to do, the other side anticipated. They knew in advance, or they seemed to. You couldn't really put your finger on it until maybe a month later, your former partner winds up going to work for that law firm. Now, those of you who are lawyers, I think, understand the concept of betrayal and of a failure to abide by a trust and an obligation. How would you feel if that were you and your firm and your ex-partner? I think you would feel, my God. Oh, by the way, the company lost its now out of business, and you don't have a client anymore. My point simply is, I do not believe that Mr. Snowden, who's given 50,000 documents to the Mr. Greenwald, who in turn is feeding to the New York Times and the Washington Post, so there will be a steady 
sequence into the indeterminate future of additional disclosures of material that was once classified. And you may read that. I may read that and say, gee, I didn't, well, I didn't know that. But also, okay, government shouldn't be doing that. And that, I suppose you can say, is worthwhile. But the problem is our government has to assume every single document he gave to Mr. Greenwald he's given to the Chinese and Russians, even if he hasn't done so, even if you could believe his lawyer when she says, oh, he told me he didn't take anything. He only gave it to Mr. Greenwald. But also, there's a lot up here. Even if he didn't download everything he could have, and, you know, he's still in Russia, and I have no doubt personally that everything he has up here, Mr. Putin and his friends and the Chinese know. And the assets that are limited enough already doing this very important job. It is fundamental importance to all of us and our well-being and our national security. You may doubt that, but it is. As I say, once in a while these applications did in fact read like a terrorist, like, like a uh, Tom Clancy novel. And I think, I don't think Mr. Innenfeld will have me indicted if I say one thing I learned that some of our enemies are. And one only has to look as far as the Crimea to see that it's not quite as safe and secure a world as we might have thought it was. I don't think that has any connection with Mr. Snowden, but my point is whatever he retained in his head, at the very least the Russians and Chinese knew. And I've retained a whole lot from my years, which ended five years ago, um, and I think most of the technology I saw then is now outmoded, but in any event, I knew at the time that there were others, if I were to tell them about it, would find it not just interesting but important and useful. And the amount of stuff that he was exposed to and that he, in fact, did download, estimates range from a half, half a million to 1.2 million documents electronically. And our government has to assume the Russians and Chinese know that. And that means they have to take those assets, hundreds of people, and try to figure out what did he have access to, what do the Russians and Chinese therefore know about our means, our methods, our targets, our sources, the people who are working for us. I mean, Robert Hansen, former head of the counter-espionage uh, counter unit of the FBI, was in the Russian payroll and caused, I don't know, 11 or 13 deaths once uh, you know, in that period of American agents in Russia. I don't know if Snowden has caused any deaths, but certainly our national well-being has been severely and drastically put at risk because we don't know how much it's been compromised. And so I, this is, I'm speaking as a citizen, not as a federal judge or a FISA court. I'm not speaking on behalf of the court, obviously, or on the judiciary. I'm speaking just as a citizen who reads the same papers you do and, and knows what little bit that much classified information that I was made privy to and how useful if I were to betray the trust and the oath that I took to disclose it to people who might find it interesting and worthwhile. And it's like, you know, mega steroids. And, and he, may, he may not have said anything. The Russians may have said, oh, you don't want to talk? That's just fine. Uh, kind of counterintuitive. But in any event, even so, we can't assume that. We can't call Mr. Putin or the whatever the Russian intelligence said. By the way, how much do you guys really know? You know, they're not going to tell us. So anyway, uh, I'm glad that you gave me the opportunity to, to, to stand on the soapbox. I know many of you disagree with me, but I hope at the very least you give some thought to that um, viewpoint when you're assessing what he did. Had he stayed here, that's something different. He might even be categorized by some at least as a hero, the way I categorize Daniel Ellsberg. I really do. But he didn't stay here. And that's all the difference in the world and all I think you really have to think about in answering the question, Snowden, patriot, or hero. So I want other questions. I got to divert. I'm glad to stay as long as you want me to. It stopped snowing, so I can get home tonight. I've got plenty of time. And it really, if people want to go, go ahead for your classes or whatever. I'm glad to stay. We do have a lunch at some point, but I'm well nourished, and I hope Mr. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Dielenfeld will let me answer whatever questions. But if you want to go, go ahead. That's fine with me.